Hi everybody, this is Rich. What you're about to hear is a debate between a theist versus an atheist where the theist wins the debate. I used to be an atheist myself, but after unbiasedly looking at the truth of science and the truth of the history of Jesus Christ and the truth of the proof and evidence of his resurrection, I have now left atheism because it's a fairy tale. Atheism provides no proof and evidence or even science that shows that it's even true, accurate, or correct. In fact, if you go to my website at shockforever.com or www.shockonnow.net, which is on your screen right now, you too will see that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God and you will come to the rational conclusion that not only does God exist, like science proves, but that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God bless you and enjoy this awesome debate. It's one of my favorites. Uh, it's, an, it's an honor this evening to have two uh, nationally, if not internationally renowned scholars debate one of the most serious issues that anyone can discuss. Uh, it is also an honor to have uh, a tremendous moderator, Mr. Kirby Anderson, who will be moderating the debate. Uh, as I was saying a moment ago, Kirby Anderson um, is somebody who many of us know very well. He is the president of Probe Ministries. Uh, Kirby did his undergraduate at Oregon State University in zoology, uh, did a master's um, I guess in uh, uh, Master's of Forensic Science at Yale University, did a Master's in Political Science at uh, Georgetown University, and did further studies in bioethics at the Kennedy Institute at Washington, D.C. So it is a privilege to have him here this evening. Let's give him a nice warm welcome. Good evening and welcome to this very important debate, why I'm a Christian, why I'm not a Christian. And I think you're going to find this a very important topic as we address this this evening and I hope that you'll be challenged to consider the presentations, the dialogue that takes place. Our goal is in this debate to try to educate you on what I think are some of the very important issues of Christianity and atheism by giving you an opportunity to hear both sides of an issue. Now before I introduce you to the two participants in the debate, I do want to set a few ground rules. This is a formal debate, not a sporting event. So activities that might be appropriate at a sporting event, like uh, cheering or booing or doing the wave, uh, probably are not appropriate. Seriously, please refrain from any outward demonstration, applause after each presentation is appropriate, but we would appreciate your uh, guidance and uh, understanding in that regard. Our two participants this evening are Dr. Keith Parsons and Dr. William Lane Craig, and perhaps if you saw the Sunday religion section edition of the Dallas Morning News, you saw the point counterpoint that they did, and I think you were probably duly impressed uh, by their credentials. Dr. Keith Parsons is currently Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the University of Houston at Clear Lake. He has his PhD in philosophy from Queen's University in Canada. He also has a PhD in the history of science from the University of Pittsburgh and has authored God and the Burden of Proof by Prometheus Books. He is the editor of a new peer-reviewed academic journal, and he is also um, involved, of course, with the Society of Humanistic Philosophers that publishes that journal. And as I understand now, he is currently working on a book on the history of paleontology and the sociology of knowledge. Dr. William Lane Craig was formerly a visiting scholar at the Higher Institute of Philosophy at the University in Belgium. He teaches adjunct as an adjunct professor at Talbot Theological Seminary. He holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Birmingham in England and also a PhD in theology from the University of Munich in Germany. He has published extensively in his uh, books, numbers such books as The Sun Rises, The Existence of God and the Beginning of the Universe, and his most recent book, Reasonable Faith. Each participant will have 20 minutes for an opening argument and then there will be 12 minutes for a first rebuttal, and then another 8 minutes for a second rebuttal. 
At that point, we will take a 10-minute break. This will be an opportunity for you to respond to some things we'll talk about a little bit later. And then when we return, we will go to a 15-minute sort of crossfire, point-counterpoint discussion, and then open it up for a 15-minute segment for question and answers. And you will notice the microphones located around the area here as well. We will then wrap up with a short conclusion and some final comments. We'll begin with Dr. William Lane Craig. Thank you, and good evening. I'm delighted to be here tonight to participate in this important debate, and I hope that you'll find it both stimulating and challenging this evening. Now, the question put to us tonight, why I am or am not a Christian, has a distinctly personal flavor to it. We're not here simply to debate, is Christianity true or false, but to explain why I am or am not a Christian. So I want to honor that personal tone by sharing quite personally with you tonight why I am a Christian. I wasn't raised in a Christian home or even a church-going family. Nevertheless, I never doubted that God exists. I remember as a boy looking up at the stars and contemplating the unimaginable vastness of the universe and thinking it all had to come from somewhere. There must be a first cause or a creator of the universe. Little did I realize that my boyish intuitions were at that very moment being confirmed by advances in astronomy and astrophysics. I remember in grade school listening to our science teacher explain the two competing theories of the origin of the universe, the Big Bang Theory and the Steady State Theory. These were, to me, mysterious and awesome matters. And it seemed inconceivable to me that the steady-state theory with its infinite, beginningless past could be correct. I was pleased that our science teacher told us that, in her opinion, the evidence favored the Big Bang Theory. In fact, it was only a few years later, in 1965, that the discovery of the cosmic background uh, microwave radiation effectively put the steady-state theory to rest. That radiation background proved that the universe was once in a very hot, and dense state, a dramatic verification of the Big Bang Theory. According to that theory, the universe has not always existed. Rather, the universe began to exist in a cataclysmic explosion about 15 billion years ago. Most laymen don't realize that according to the Big Bang Theory, not only were all matter and energy created in the Big Bang, but physical space and time themselves. This is of utmost importance because it means, as the Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle points out, that the Big Bang Theory requires the creation of the universe from nothing. Now, obviously, many scientists were deeply disturbed with the idea that the universe came into being out of nothing. This seems self-evidently absurd. Moreover, it seems to point to the need for a transcendent creator of the universe, which is anathema to secular minds. So over the decades, one theory after another has been put forward to try to dislodge the Big Bang Theory and avoid the beginning of the universe. For example, the oscillating universe theory, vacuum fluctuation theories, quantum gravity theories, and so on. And one after another, these alternative theories have bit the dust. With each failure, the Big Bang Theory has been corroborated. According to Stephen Hawking in his most recent book, The Nature of Space and Time, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, this tends to be very awkward for the atheist. For as Anthony Kenny of Oxford University urges, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. Now, from the very nature of the case, 
as the cause of space and time. This cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being of unimaginable power which created the universe. It must be timeless and therefore changeless because it created time. Because it also created space. It must transcend space as well and therefore be immaterial, not physical. Moreover, I want to argue it must also be personal. For if the changeless, impersonal uh, conditions for the existence of the universe existed eternally, then the cause could never exist without its effect. If the changeless, impersonal conditions for an effect are timelessly present, then the effect must be timelessly present as well. To illustrate, imagine that the temperature, or rather the cause of water's freezing, is the temperature being below zero degrees centigrade. If the temperature were below zero from eternity, then any water around would be frozen from eternity. It would be impossible for the water to just begin to freeze a finite time ago. The only way for the cause to be timeless and the effect to begin a finite time ago is for the cause to be a personal agent who freely chooses to create an effect in time without any prior determining conditions. For example, a man sitting from eternity could will to stand up. And thus we are brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. And thus it seems to me that we have good reasons to believe what intuitively struck me as a boy. The universe is not eternal and uncaused, but was brought into being by a transcendent personal creator. Now, although I believed in God, nevertheless God was not a reality in my life. He was the creator of the universe far removed and distant from my experience. As I moved into my teenage years, I began to ask the big questions in life. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? And as I wrestled with these questions, I found myself sinking into ever deeper despair. In the face of my own eventual death, and ultimately the inevitable extinction of mankind and the heat death of the universe, Everything seemed so pointless. Human life, my life, became just a brief and transitory blip in the purposeless plunge of the universe toward extinction and oblivion. The poet Stephen Crane effectively captured these sentiments in the following verses. A man said to the universe, Sir, I exist. However, replied the universe, the fact has not created in me a sense of obligation. It was only later in life that I learned that I was experiencing what existentialist philosophers call angst, a deep despair or hopelessness at the core of one's being in the face of the absurdity of life. The French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre analyzed the notion of my death and showed that in light of your impending death, no matter how distant, the life you have left is ultimately absurd. As Sartre puts it, several hours or several years make no difference once you have lost eternity. If there is no immortality, then life is without ultimate meaning, value, or purpose. It is without meaning because without immortality, it literally does not matter how you live. Everything will wind up the same. It is without value because right and wrong, even if they exist, which is doubtful on an atheistic view, don't matter because your destiny is ultimately unrelated to how you live. It is without purpose because the purposes we invent to fill our lives, say, becoming a doctor or an artist or a baseball player, are all ultimately futile and fleeting gestures against the inevitable fall of darkness. In my high school English class, we read Shakespeare's Macbeth. The play's most memorable lines are perhaps those of Macbeth upon the death of his wife. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more.
It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. In the search for answers, I began to attend a large church in our community. But instead of answers, all I found was a social country club where the dues were a dollar a week in the offering plate. And the other high school students who pretended to be such good Christians on Sunday, well, I knew what kind of lives they were really living the rest of the week. I resented their hypocrisy and phoniness, and so I began to withdraw into myself. I thought, I don't need people. As Simon and Garfunkel said, I had my books and my poetry to protect me. I was on my way to becoming a very alienated young man. The anger and the hopelessness that I felt just ate away at me inside, so that every day became a burden. Then one day, when I was feeling particularly miserable, I walked into my high school German class and sat down behind a girl who's one of these types, you know, that is always so happy, it just makes you sick. And I tapped her on the shoulder and she turned around and I said, Sandy, what are you always so happy about for anyway? And she said, well, Bill, it's because I know Jesus Christ is my personal savior. And I said, well, I go to church. And she said, that's not enough, Bill. You've got to have him really living in your heart. Well, what would he want to do a thing like that for? She said, because he loves you, Bill. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Here I was so filled with anger and despair. And she said there was someone who really loved me. And who was it but the God of the universe? And that thought just staggered me to think that the God of the universe could love that worm named Bill Craig down there on that speck of dust called planet Earth. And so I began the most intense period of soul searching of my entire life. I read the New Testament from cover to cover. And as I did so, I was captivated by the person Jesus of Nazareth. His words had the ring of truth about them. And his life had an authenticity which was not characteristic of those who claimed to be his followers in the church I was attending. I found that I could not reject him. On the contrary, I was drawn to him. I learned that my problem was sin. I knew that although my life was externally upright, my heart was selfish and twisted within. I learned that as a result, I was spiritually dead and alienated from God. And that's why he seemed so distant and unreal. But Jesus claimed to have come for people like me. He said, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. By his death on the cross, he paid the penalty for sin that I deserved so that I might be forgiven and restored to a right relationship with God, my Heavenly Father. But it wasn't enough for me just to believe these things. Something had to happen to me or in me. I had to be spiritually regenerated or reborn by receiving God's Spirit. God promised to bestow upon me not only forgiveness, but also eternal life with Him. There was nothing I could do to earn this. It was a gift of God's grace which I could only gratefully receive. The message of Christ thus spoke volumes to my existential predicament. Here was the fulfillment of human existence. Here was the knowledge of God and his unbounded love. Here was the promise of eternal life, which infused the life I was now living with eternal significance, meaning, and purpose. For the choices that I made now had eternal consequences. God had given me the awesome freedom to determine my own eternal destiny. Well, at the time, I had never heard of biblical criticism, and it never occurred to me to doubt the historical veracity of the Gospels. I just had a deep sense as I read the teachings of Jesus that what he said was true. Since then, I've attended seminary where I studied Hebrew and Greek and completed doctoral studies in theology, specializing on the historicity of the resurrection narratives in the New Testament. I've been gratified to discover that the intuitive trust which I, as a teenager, placed in the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and teaching was historically well-founded. It is nothing short of amazing to me that the historical facts which inductively imply the resurrection of Jesus 
are generally agreed upon today by New Testament scholars. These facts are as follows. Number one, on the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist in the resurrection reports, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. According to the New Testament critic D. H. Van Dalen, it is extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. Fact number two, on multiple occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. This is a fact which is almost universally acknowledged among New Testament scholars. Even the skeptical German New Testament critic Gerhard Ludemann admits, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Finally, fact number three, the original disciples believed that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every reason not to. Think of the situation that the disciples faced following Jesus' death. First of all, their leader was dead. And Jews had no belief in a dying, much less a rising Messiah. Moreover, Jesus' execution as a criminal showed him out to be a heretic, a man literally under the curse of God. Finally, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead prior to the general resurrection at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples believed in and were willing to go to their deaths for the fact of Jesus' resurrection. Luke Johnson, a New Testament scholar from Emory University, says, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, concludes, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. There is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these three facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. Well, as I said, the message of Christ spoke to my existential need. So about six months after my classmate Sandy first shared the good news of Christ with me, I just came to the end of my rope and yielded my life to God. I cried out all of the bitterness and anger that was in me, and I felt at the same time a tremendous infusion of joy, like a balloon just being blown up and blown up until it was ready to burst. I rushed outside, and I remember it was one of those warm Midwestern nights when you could see the Milky Way spread from horizon to horizon. And I looked up at the stars, and I thought, God, I've come to know God. And that moment changed my whole life. God became a living reality to me, a reality that I've walked with day by day, year by year, over the last 30 years. In the absence of overwhelming arguments for atheism, it seems to me that I'm perfectly rational to believe in God on the basis of his immediate presence in my life. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I think that I thus have more warrant for believing that God has touched my life than I do for the premises of any argument against God. So, in conclusion, if you were to ask me why I am a Christian, I would appeal not only to the evidence for a creator of the universe and for the resurrection of Jesus, but also to the undeniability of God's personal presence in my life, a reality which I believe you too can discover if you will seek him with an open mind and an open heart.
Thank you, Dr. Craig. We'll now hear the opening argument from Dr. Keith Parsons. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. It has been genuinely warm. Thank you to Walter Newsbaum for his fine job of uh, organizing uh, everything. I certainly appreciate it. Everybody that I've met has just been wonderful. Thanks very much for being here tonight. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say some things which some of you might not like. I'm not going to pull any punches. I assume that if you're here this evening, you're willing to be here to have your faith challenged. Okay? And that's what I'm going to do. The purpose of this lecture is to give my reasons for not being a Christian. I am not rash enough to suppose that my reasons for unbelief will convince any member of this audience to surrender his or her Christian beliefs. That is not my intention anyway. I'm not here to deconvert anybody. I have two aims tonight, one weaker and one stronger. The weaker aim is to convince you that conscientious, well-considered skepticism about Christianity is an intellectually and morally respectable position. This is an important lesson for those, and I fear there are many of them, who want to see this nation turned into a truly Christian nation. My more ambitious aim is to argue that the weight of argument and evidence does not support the core claim of Christianity, the alleged resurrection of Jesus Christ. As St. Paul recognized, this is the doctrine on which all else stands or fails. I shall not claim that it is necessarily irrational for Christians to believe in the resurrection. I shall claim that for those of us, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, etc., not already committed to that belief, that the arguments and evidence so far given are far too weak to overcome that initial implausibility. So why not just be a Christian? Why not just be one? I was happy as a Christian. The majesty and beauty of Genesis and Psalms moved me then and moves me now. The image of a stern but loving God who someday would right every wrong and dry every tear was a noble and inspiring vision. The hope of heaven and reunion with lost loved ones was a deep comfort in a world torn by tragedy and loss. Christian music from Amazing Grace to Beethoven's Misa Solemnis has a depth and majesty seldom achieved in other music. I am not a Christian today for two reasons. Because I believe that Christianity is not good and that it is not true. For me, the first step from faith was, paradoxically, reading the Bible. Of course, I had known all along that the Bible contained horrific elements. In 2 Kings chapter 2, Elisha is jeered by some boys as he approaches the town of Bethel. Elisha curses them in the name of the Lord. And the Bible records that two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the children. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, the prophet Samuel, in the name of the Lord, orders Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites. And I'm quoting from the Bible now. Spare no one. Put them all to death. Men and women, children and babes in arms, herds and flocks, camels and asses. That's 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3. As I really began to read deeply in the Bible, I was shocked at how many atrocities I found. Could this be the word of God? What about Tom Paine, one of the founding, founding fathers of this country? Well, here's what he had to say about it, and I quote him. Whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and torturous executions, the unrelenting vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we called it the word of a demon rather than the word of God. It is a history of wickedness that has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind, and for my part, I sincerely detest it as I detest all that is cruel. Further, pat responses by religious apologists did not convince me. I simply could not believe that the Amalekites, even babes in arms, were so evil as to merit utter extermination. Second, though I had always known that Christian history had its dark side, when I really began to study church history in earnest, I was overwhelmed at the extent of the holy horrors perpetrated in the name of Christ. Even Christian historians such as Paul Johnson wax eloquent recounting <coughs> the persecutions, pogroms, crusades, witch hunts, inquisitions, religious wars, etc., whereby countless people were burned, butchered, tortured, and imprisoned by God-fearing fanatics. In his recent bestseller, Hitler's Willing Executioners, Daniel Goldhagen traces the long disgraceful history of Christian anti-Semitism. The hatred sown in Martin Luther's rabid anti-Jewish diatribes was reaped at Auschwitz. Forrest G. Wood's book, The Arrogance of Faith, details the complicity of Christians in the genocide of American Indians and in the defense of slavery. Christian bigots today continue to promote the hatred of gay people. Again, I was not convinced by the standard apologetic line about the holy horrors. 
I was told that the people who perpetrated such things were not acting in the true spirit of Christ or in accordance with the true gospel message. But my friends, this rang hollow. It sounded too much like the apologetics of academic Marxists. You ever run into one of those, academic Marxists? Okay. It sounded too much like the apologetics of academic Marxists who admitted the horrors of Stalin's gulag, but then denied that the Soviet Union was a true communist society. Surely, though, as Marx himself insisted, what matters is not abstract promises, but how a scheme works out in practice. In similarly pragmatic vein, Jesus said of false prophets, by their fruits shall ye know them. Indeed. Indeed. Still, you might object, shouldn't we judge Christianity in its pure, revealed form, rather than as practiced by notoriously fallible and sinful human beings? It is the original vision that counts, not its shoddy practice. Remember, though, that the monstrous doctrine of hell is part and parcel of the alleged Christian revelation. The greatest Christian thinkers and theologians, from St. Augustine to Jonathan Edwards, exhausted their vast powers of eloquence in their lurid depictions of hell. I shall spare the audience an account of these revolting fantasies, surely the most misshapen progeny of the human imagination. Even worse, all the most orthodox theologians, Catholics as well as Calvinists, insisted that one of the greatest joys of heaven is the viewing of the torments of the damned. Surely in the words of pain, such doctrines have served to corrupt and brutalize mankind. Cruel dogmas make cruel people. I hope that my argument has convinced you that a rational and conscientious person may doubt the goodness of Christianity, both as it is preached and as it is practiced. The Christian Bible is full of atrocities ordered or committed by God. Christianity produced St. Francis and Mother Teresa, but it also produced grand inquisitors and the authors of Malleus Maleficarum, the witch hunter's handbook. Today's Christian coalition dreams of a golden age when we truly have one nation under their God. History shows that a holy inquisition would be more likely than a golden age. Finally, Orthodox Christians to this day defend the outrageous doctrine of hell, a doctrine that represents God as an ogre, far crueler than any human despot. To me, then, Christianity is a bleak doctrine, one that has preached hatred, soaked the earth with blood, and filled the mind with supernatural terrors. I sincerely hope that it is false. Why then do I regard it as in fact false? St. Paul laid it on the line. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14, he says, If Christ was not raised, then our gospel is null and void. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not believe that Christ was raised from the dead, so I regard the gospel that proclaims him as null and void. My argument against the resurrection is simple. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The purported resurrection of Jesus is about as extraordinary as a claim can get. The evidence in favor of the resurrection is not good, so we shouldn't believe it. It is just a matter of common sense that we should place a high burden of proof on extraordinary claims. Suppose I had opened this talk by saying, I just flew in from Chicago, and boy, are my arms tired. Surely you would demand very good reason indeed before you regarded this as anything other than an ancient joke. Suppose that the Reverend Billy Graham solemnly assured you that the cow in the nursery rhyme really did jump over the moon. Surely you would demand hard evidence for such an outrageous claim, even coming from so respected and trustworthy a source. What's more, then, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So why do I say that the alleged resurrection of Jesus was so extraordinary? Well, surely if we know anything about the world, we know that dead people tend to stay dead. Otherwise, why should we see irony in the following notice from our Department of Social Services. Dear sir, you will no longer receive food stamps because our department has received word of your death. You must inform us in writing within 30 days if there is a change in your circumstances. Sorry, folks. Why are the reports of Elvis sightings material for the supermarket tabloids? Because we all rightly are very skeptical of reports of the resuscitations of corpses. The New Testament reports of Jesus' post-mortem appearances are even more extraordinary. Jesus was supposedly resurrected, not just resuscitated. His supernatural resurrected body could suddenly appear and disappear and pass through solid walls and doors into closed rooms. Surely a resurrected Jesus would be far more extraordinary than even a resuscitated Elvis. Here you might respond, wait a second, Parsons. Of course you, you atheist, are extremely skeptical of the resurrection. Like other unbelievers, you reject the whole concept of the miraculous and you display a touching faith in the so-called laws of nature. 
I, however, you might say, believe in a God who can alter or suspend such laws at will. After all, the laws of nature don't tell us how things must behave, only how they usually do behave, unless, that is, God chooses they behave differently. Therefore, you might say to that evil atheist Parsons, I do not have to rate the plausibility of miracle reports nearly as low as you do. But even if you believe in God, and even if you believe that miracles do occur, you must admit that the truth of any particular miracle report is initially most unlikely. After all, miracle reports come a dime for a dozen. It hucksters and hoaxers abound, as do false prophets and false religions. So there will be very many specious miracle reports. As a glance at the New Age or occult section of any bookstore shows you, humans have a strong inclination to believe the extraordinary over the mundane. This is why we must repeatedly inculcate the maxim, when you hear a hoofbeats in the distance, think, aha, horses, not aha, unicorns. So, whether we are theist or atheist, our initial attitude towards any particular miracle claim must be that it is extremely implausible. This does not mean that evidence cannot, in principle, establish a miracle claim. It doesn't even mean that human testimony can never establish such a claim. It does mean that the burden of proof on miracle claimers must be very heavy. As David Hume put it in his famous miracle maxim, when someone claims a miracle, we should demand that their testimony be so trustworthy that its falsehood would be an even bigger miracle than the miracle they are claiming. Does the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus meet this heavy burden of proof? Nearly all of the so-called evidence comes from the four canonical gospels, but let's be honest. What confidence can we have in documents, one, authored by persons unknown, clearly not eyewitnesses, two, written four or more decades after the events they purported to describe, three, drawn upon oral traditions, and hence subject to the unreliability of human memory, four, each with a clear theological bias and apologetic agenda, five, containing many identifiably fictitious literary forms, Six, inconsistent with each other except where one gospel plagiarizes another. Seven, at odds with known facts. Eight, with virtually no support from independent sources. And nine, testifying to events which in ordinary circumstances we would regard as unlikely in the extreme. Well, Professor Craig believes that there are three main points of evidence that support the historical case for the resurrection of Jesus. The post-mortem appearances, the empty tomb, and the origin of the Christian faith. In my remaining time, I shall explain why I reject each of these pieces of purported evidence. The post-mortem appearances. Professor Craig places much emphasis upon the formula recited by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, where Paul lists various alleged witnesses of the risen Jesus. Cephas, Simon Peter, the Twelve, over 500 at once, James, Jesus' brother, all of the apostles, and finally Paul himself. This passage is important because it is very early. It names or refers to numerous alleged witnesses of Jesus the risen Jesus, and it purports to give Paul's own testimony, the only undisputed first-person report of an encounter with Jesus in the entire New Testament. First, the early date of the formula is irrelevant. Contrary to a claim frequently made by Professor Craig and other apologists, legends can and do spread almost immediately, despite the opposition of eyewitnesses, and sometimes even with the connivance of eyewitnesses. Consider Elvis and Bigfoot sightings, Bermuda Triangle disappearances, alien abductions, crash saucer stories, and other such goofy legends. Such stories spread quickly, often despite the testimony of eyewitnesses and the efforts of would-be debunkers. Surely people are not more credulous now than they were in the first century. Anyone who insists that the resurrection accounts cannot be legendary simply opposes common sense. Getting back to Paul's testimony, let's get back to Paul's testimony. It gives no details. It does not mention the empty tomb, even though in doing so, even though doing so would have strengthened Paul's case. It gives no place or date to the alleged resurrection. The Gospels and Acts know nothing of an appearance of, to the 500. Surely they would have reported such a remarkable event. Paul does not make clear why the apparent, whether the appearances were physical or visionary. The Greek text, folks, is entirely ambiguous on this point. More importantly, we know nothing of the reliability of any of the so-called witnesses. How reliable were Peter or James? How do we know that the 500, if they really existed, did not suffer a mass hallucination? What then about Paul's eyewitness testimony? As T.H. Huxley noted in a classic essay, if we accepted all of the eyewitness reports of miracles from old texts, we would be credulous indeed. Is Paul then particularly credible? On the contrary, Paul himself states that he was given to ecstatic visions. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul tells us of being caught up as far as the third heaven, verse 2 and not knowing whether he was in the body or out of it, verse 2 repeated in verse 3. He reports that he was caught up into paradise, verse 4, and that he heard words so secret 
that no human lips may repeat them. Verse 4. Clearly this is an account of a mystical vision. Why not conclude that Paul's experience of the risen Christ was of a similar kind? Now for the empty tomb legend. Professor Craig adduces, Paul, adduces Paul's testimony for, in the first Corinthians 15 formula that Jesus was buried as evidence for the empty tomb. But reciting such a liturgical formula no more implies knowledge of an empty tomb than singing John Brown's body lies a mulvern in the grave implies knowledge of where John Brown is buried. Professor Craig also argues that had the stories of the empty tomb been fictitious, the prejudices of the day would have dictated that they be discovered, that the accounts indicated the discoverers of the empty tomb were men rather than women. But the gospel accounts say that the disciples fled into hiding with Jesus' arrest, leaving only the women to care for the body. Besides, the washing, wrapping, and anointing of bodies was women's work in those days. Therefore, it is utterly unsurprising that the fictional account, that a fictional account would depict women as the discoverers of the empty tomb. More fundamentally, as, as the right Reverend Bishop Shelby, Shelby Spong says, quote, the discovery of an empty tomb would never have issued in an Easter faith. If there had been a tomb, and if the tomb had been found empty, it would have meant only that one more insult had been delivered to the leader of the tiny Jesus movement. The disciples, whoever they were, would not have concluded that, would have concluded that even the dead body of this Jesus had not been spared degradation. No Easter faith would have resulted from an empty tomb. Therefore, such a tradition cannot have been primary. It was but a story incorporated later into the narrative. Professor Craig's third main piece of evidence for the resurrection is the origin of the Christian faith itself. He argues that the Christian faith <coughs> is a res in a resurrected Jesus has no precedent in Jewish thought. The Jewish conception of resurrection is a general raising of the dead at the end of time, not the raising to glory of a single individual as an event in history. Further, the Christian idea that the resurrection of the righteous will somehow hinge on the Messiah's resurrection was, was wholly unknown. Professor Craig concludes that these new Christian ideas were so radical that only the actual resurrection of Jesus can account for so extreme a conceptual shift. But according to the Gospels, Jesus' ministry contained many heretical elements. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus, is claim, Jesus claims authority for the forgiveness of sins, which elicits a charge of blasphemy from the scribes. In Mark 7, he sets aside the traditional dietary distinctions between clean and unclean foods. In Mark 2, 28, he even claims to be sovereign over the Sabbath. Further, Jesus' preaching was full of apocalyptic content. He famously said, Truly I say unto you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. In Mark 8.31 and 10.34, he predicts that the Son of Man will die and rise three days later. Given the heretical and apocalyptic nature of their master's teachings and the experiences, whatever they were, that convinced them that Jesus had risen, the emergence of radically new concepts in the disciples' minds hardly seems to require supernatural explanation. For the early Christians, the resurrection of Jesus was the first eschatological event, an event that ushered in the new age, the coming of the kingdom. They believed that they were in the end times. In all honesty, folks, I simply do not see here a gaping, unbridgeable conceptual chasm between belief in a general resurrection at the end of time and the belief that Jesus' resurrection was the first event of the coming of the end time. In the, present, in the presently fashionable lingo, paradigm shifts do occur. If Professor Craig insists that nonetheless, <clears throat> uh, nonetheless such a conceptual shift requires supernatural intervention, I simply have to ask, what are his criteria? At what point do concepts become so alien that it would require a miracle for someone to shift from one to the other? We need some such guidelines before the discussion can proceed. In conclusion, H.G. Wells one time said, every dogma has its day. Christianity's day has been rather long, 2,000 years. I think that's long enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Parsons. We'll now move into our rebuttal period. The first uh, section will be two 12-minute rebuttals, beginning with Dr. William Lane Craig. In his opening speech, Dr. Parson offered two reasons why he's not a Christian. First, that Christianity, Christianity is not good. Secondly, that Christianity is not true. Let's look first at that uh, contention that Christianity is not good. He gave several reasons why he thinks Christianity is not good. First, that in the Old Testament there are atrocities in which God destroys various people uh, and that this is, uh, shows that God is not good. 
I think I would simply respond to this by saying that God, as the author and giver of life, has the right to take human life as he wills and to give human life as he wills. I would not have the right, for example, to go over and murder Dr. Parsons as he sits at the table there. But I think that God has it perfectly within his rights to strike someone dead at any moment that he would choose. So uh, if God chooses to take human life, I simply don't see that that is not good. What about the horrors of Christian history? Well, I certainly do agree that Christians have done many bad things down through history, but on balance, the record of the Christian faith is remarkably good. Kenneth Scott Latterette, the great Yale church historian, has written, We have much to say about the effects of Christianity upon the collective life of mankind as a whole. Here has been the most potent force which mankind has known for the dispelling of illiteracy, the creation of schools, the emergence of new types of education. From Christianity have issued impulses for daring intellectual and geographic adventures. The universities were largely Christian creations. Music, architecture, painting, poetry, and philosophy have owed some of their greatest achievements to Christianity. Democracy, as it was known in the 19th and 20th centuries, was in large part the outgrowth of Christian teaching brought on by famine and for the creation of hospitals and orphanages. So that, yes, there have been atrocities perpetrated in the name of Christ, but on balance, Christianity has been the most potent force for good in the history of mankind. Secondly, I would simply say that when Christians have failed to live up to Jesus' example, that that isn't an indictment of Jesus. Jesus wouldn't have been a guard at Auschwitz. Jesus wouldn't have been a persecutor of people who disagreed with him. He taught to turn the other cheek. And it's Jesus that I'm defending tonight, not the record of the Christian church, which so often fails him. Now, Dr. Parsons then raised the third point, that hell is an awful doctrine. Well, what I would simply say here is that hell is the result of persons who freely separate themselves from God. It is not a result of God's will or desire. The Bible clearly says God's desire is that every person should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, and that's why he gave his son, so that everyone would come to know him. The only reason that everybody doesn't go to heaven is because some people freely separate themselves from God forever. So yes, this is terrible, but it's simply testimony to the depravity of man that it would spit in the face of God and the, the gift of his grace and forgiveness. So on the contrary, I would say Christianity is good. It is good news. It is the most wonderful news that has ever been announced. But is it true? Well, here we come to the central miracle of the New Testament, the resurrection of Jesus. And Dr. Parson says, first, you've got to bear a very heavy burden of proof, uh, Mr. Or Dr. Craig, because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. This is a watchword of the free thought movement today that I always hear repeated. But when I think about it, I can think of almost no justification for that principle. I do not think it is true that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. As Thomas Sherlock pointed out in his book on the resurrection of Jesus, it doesn't take extraordinary evidence to establish that someone is alive. That, that's easy to do. Nor does it take extraordinary evidence to establish that someone is dead. That's accepted in any court of law. But to prove the resurrection of Jesus, all you need is good testimony that somebody was alive, and then he was dead, and then he was alive again. So I don't see that extraordinary events do require extraordinary evidence. The germ of truth in this statement, however, I think, is that certain explanations are not the best explanation because they're ad hoc, they're contrived. That's the problem with saying, oh, I saw someone flapping his arms and flying about the room. It's that that is an ad hoc explanation, it's contrived, there are better explanations than that. So the question is, when you come to the resurrection of Jesus, is the best explanation a supernatural explanation or a naturalistic one? And I contend it is not ad hoc to appeal to a supernatural explanation in this case because of the religio-historical context in which that event occurred. The resurrection of Jesus is not just the resurrection of someone or anybody. It's the resurrection of Jesus who claimed to be the absolute revelation of God, who made these remarkable claims that Dr. Parson referred to. It comes as the climax of his own unparalleled life and teachings and is, as it were, a divine vindication of those radical claims to be the Son of God and the revelation of God to mankind. And therefore, this uh, explanation, I think, is not ad hoc or contrived. On the contrary, it fits like a hand in a glove into the life and teachings of Jesus. Well, what about the specific evidence? Dr. Parsons invades against the Gospels on several grounds. 
uh, about how they're based on oral tradition and uh, so forth. But at the end of the day, the fact is that compared to other sources of ancient history, the Gospels compare very well. R.T. France, who is a New Testament scholar, writes, at the level of their literary and historical character, we have good reason to trust the gospel seriously as a source of information on the life and teaching of Jesus. Ancient historians have sometimes commented that the degree of skepticism with which New Testament scholars approach their sources is far greater than would be thought justified in any other branch of ancient history. Indeed, many ancient historians would count themselves fortunate to have four such responsible accounts written within a generation or two of the events and preserved in such a wealth of early manuscript evidence. And then listen to what he concludes. The decision as to how far a scholar is willing to accept the record they offer is likely to be influenced more by his openness to a supernaturalistic worldview than by strictly historical considerations. In other words, skepticism about the Gospels, let's face it, is not rooted in their historical and literary quality, which is very good. It's rooted in an anti-supernatural bias, and I think that that's been evident in Dr. Parsons' own remarks tonight. Now, what specifically can we say about the appearances, the empty tomb, and the origin of the Christian faith? First, with respect to the appearances, I pointed out that it is uh, universally agreed upon by New Testament scholars today that the earliest disciples did experience appearances of Jesus. Dr. Parsons simply flies in the face of New Testament scholarship. Why? Well, he says because legends can arise rapidly, and he gives the example of UFO reports, Elvis sightings, and so forth. This is just based on a misunderstanding. UFO sightings, Elvis reports, Bermuda Triangle are not of the genre of legend. Legend concerns how oral tradition being passed from one generation to another eventually gets transformed, like in the child's game of telephone, into a completely different story. And the classical Greco-Roman historian A.N. Sherwin-White has said that even two generations is too short a time span for oral, or rather for legendary tendencies to wipe out the hard core of oral tradition. So we're not talking here about lies, fabrications, hoaxes, and so forth. We're talking about how long it takes for oral tradition to be completely reformed so that the memory of the original event is forgotten and be replaced by something else. This typically takes centuries, as in the uh, legends of King Arthur or the legends of Alexander the Great, which didn't arise until centuries after those people were dead and gone. By contrast, in the Gospels, these accounts are written within the first generation during the lifetime of the eyewitnesses, so I don't think they're legendary. Moreover, I want to point out that they are multiply attested, not simply by Paul, but also by the Gospels, where you have independent, multiple attestation of these events. And that's why most uh, New Testament scholars, unlike Dr. Parsons, believe these events really happened. Now, could they, however, have been hallucinations, as Dr. Parsons suggests? I think not. Number one, hallucinations cannot explain the physicality of the appearances. They were physical, as narrated in the Gospels. Two, the number and the various circumstances of the appearances preclude hallucinations. Jesus wasn't just seen one time, but many times. Not just by one person, but many people. Not on just one occasion, but under many occasions. Not just by individuals, but by groups. The hallucination hypothesis just can't be stretched to accommodate that diversity. Thirdly, the disciples weren't psychologically disposed to hallucinate. They had no expectation of seeing Jesus alive again. And I'll say something more about that in a minute. Fourthly, hallucinations would never have led to belief in Jesus' resurrection. It would at most have led them to believe that Jesus had been assumed into heaven. And that's where they saw him, in Abraham's bosom. Not that he had been literally raised from the dead. And in any case, hallucinations, fifthly, cannot explain the empty tomb. Well, now, what about the empty tomb? Here, Dr. Parsons says, it's not surprising the empty tomb would be discovered, uh, or, or the narrative would have women discover the empty tomb. I simply disagree. The reason this is remarkable is because the testimony of women was thoroughly unreliable in that day. They didn't wash and dispose the body of Jesus. This was done by Joseph of Arimathea. So you have to account, why would they have a narrative of unreliable testimony rather than male disciples testifying to this? If this were a late legendary account, you can be sure it would have been male disciples who were made to discover the empty tomb. And thus Jacob Kramer, writing in 1993, says that most exegetes ascribe to the tomb narrative a historical core, however this is to be more precisely determined. 
Raymond Schwager in 1993 says, in contrast to the legend hypothesis, it has recently become usual to assess positively the behavior of the women uh, with respect to Jesus' death and on Easter morning. So I think this is a good reason to accept the empty tomb, as most uh, New Testament scholars do. Finally, the origin of the Christian faith, he says, maybe they came up with this idea because Jesus predicted his resurrection. But you see, the skeptic can't argue that way, because the skeptical scholar doesn't think Jesus predicted his resurrection. They think those predictions were written back in after the fact. If you accept that Jesus did predict his resurrection, then you've got to also accept the historicity of the empty tomb narratives, the appearances, and so forth, because those narratives are better attested historically than the fact that Jesus predicted his resurrection. Do you see the point? If you accept the predictions, then a fortiori, you've got to accept the empty tomb and the appearances, and thus I think we have good reason for believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. And now a 12-minute rebuttal from Dr. Keith Parsons. Okay, thanks. I'd like to begin by addressing a couple of points that Dr. Craig made in his opening speech, which I didn't address at that time. First of all, Dr. Craig indicated that he thinks that life is meaningless without belief in a personal God. At least that's how I understood him, but unless you believe in a personal God, somehow your life is meaningless. Folks, I'm afraid to say that I'm going to have to be rather dismissive with respect to that claim. Maybe it will be justified at greater length in a little while. Uh, is he honestly saying that Bertrand Russell led a meaningless life? That, that Spinoza led a meaningless life? I should have such a meaningless life. Is he saying that Einstein, who did not believe in a personal God, led a meaningless life? Uh, he, must be, he must be defining meaning in some way other than we normally do. If so, I hope that he would uh, elucidate on that point. Also, Dr. Craig appealed a great deal to personal experience. He has had a personal, overwhelming, born-again experience of a living God. Well, what about those of us, including myself, that have had an experience of searching for God and not finding? Honestly, openly, earnestly searching and not finding. There are many people like me. Uh, all that I can understand that Dr. Craig can do is just simply deny that there are people like me or that my experience is genuine. And if he denies it, I'll just reassert it again. Because I stand on that just as much as he stands on his claim to personal experience. I have just as much right to appeal to personal experience as he does. Okay, well, let's take a look at some of the other uh, things which he, has, uh, which he has said in uh, response to uh, my opening one. Uh, first of all, uh, he's talking about uh, some of the, out, uh, some of the uh, stories that they have in the uh, Old Testament and other places in which it says God has the right to kill a human being. My friends, I must have just expressed shock at this. God has the right to be a homicidal maniac, to kill human beings whenever he wants to, Folks, let's use a thought experiment. That's what we do in philosophy. We have thought experiments. If you created a race, let's say, of sentient robots, and you were their creator, would you have the right then to slaughter them at will? I think all of us would say no. We have no right to take away the lives, to slaughter sentient robots if we were to create them. What right then does God have to be a homicidal maniac? Uh, consider some of the other things. He talked about the uh, outrageous things which uh, Christians have done through... Uh, uh, history and how this is counterbalanced by the many good things. Well, we could go on to these lists forever. I have a wonderful quote from Senator Sam Irvin uh, of South Carolina in which he goes on for an entire page describing in exquisite detail all of the incredibly horrible things, the murders and the massacres and these sorts of things done by Christians. Now, surely Christianity has done some good things. Many other forces in the world have done good things. What right does he have to say that Christianity is the greatest force for good in the world? What right? How does he justify that? What right has he got to claim that? I absolutely see no justification for that at all. Uh, but it's even if Christianity has done some good things, remember Christianity is supposed to be the answer. It's supposed to make, uh, it's supposed to be the answer for the world. It's supposed to be the way that we all should live. But once again, as Jesus himself said, by their fruit, shall you know them. And there's some pretty stinking fruit out there, I'd have to say. Okay, uh, concerning hell, uh, Professor Craig says that humans freely choose hell. You freely choose hell, God doesn't send you to hell, you freely choose hell. Now folks, anybody who freely chose eternal torment over eternal bliss would be a lunatic. 
And lunatics deserve treatment, not condemnation. Seriously. Uh, so I'm going to have to see some justification for this. That uh, that uh, they and even if we freely choose to rebel against God, again, why should God attach so horrible a penalty to it? God is supposed to freely offer us salvation. This is supposed to be a free gift. Uh, we are supposed to have free will. We are supposed to be able to freely choose to accept or decline that gift. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the same sort of free will that is given you by the mugger in the alley who holds a pistol to your head and says, give me your wallet or I'll blow your brains out. Yes, you have free will. You don't give him the wallet, he blows your brains out. Same thing is given to us by God. You know, believe in me, love me, trust me, believe all this nonsense I've written in this ridiculous old book or I'll send you to hell. Folks, I cannot... It's not that I don't believe it. It's not that I have a bias against the supernatural. So I cannot believe such things. Okay, well, he says also that uh, I uh, uh, was mistaken in talking about extraordinary claims requiring extraordinary evidence. Again, folks, this is just a matter of common sense. If I came in and I told you that I saw a goat tied up outside, you'd say, well, that's possible. Maybe it was a fraternity boy prank. If I came in and said I saw a Tyrannosaurus Rex tied up outside, You'd say, poor Dr. Parsons, he's been standing in that Dallas sun too long, it's addled his brains. Common sense tells us that, yes, extraordinary claims do require extraordinary evidence. Interestingly enough, philosophy substantiates this claim. Uh, there's a whole field of confirmation theory in philosophy of science called Bayesian confirmation theory that insists that we must assign prior probabilities to claims. Uh, I have a mathematical proof of that principle. If Professor Craig would care to... Uh, uh, check the mathematics, I'd be happy to send it to him, uh, done by Professor Donald Gillies, a proof of, uh, a proof of that principle. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, the Gospels compare well with other ancient documents, but so much more is expected of the Gospels than other ancient documents. No one bases their faith, their life choices, their existential choices upon the annals of Tacitus or Suetonius' Twelve Caesars or Homer's Iliad. We have every right to expect a much higher degree of accuracy, a much higher degree of reliability from the New Testament than we have there. Okay, now, as for the experiences, the appearances of Jesus, Dr. Craig said that I deny these. I do not. I do not deny that the disciples had an experience which they interpreted, which they took as being an appearance of Jesus. I think they probably did. Well, how do we account for that? How, how can we say that they could possibly have had such an, an experience? Well... Once again, he very far too quickly and dismissively uh, disregards the uh, explanation of hallucination. I was just simply reading the Encyclopedia of Psychology recently. It says that one-eighth to two-thirds of normal human beings experience waking hallucinations. Now, one of the standard characteristics of many hallucinations is that they seem extremely real. Very, very real. In fact, there are classes of hallucinations. For instance, there are hypnagogic, hypnopompic hallucinations, which are experienced, and the people who experience these hallucinations almost always say, yes, it seems so real. Consider Whitley Strieber, the one who wrote Communion, about who he was supposedly abducted by space aliens. Supposedly, he was asleep in his farm in Vermont, and the gray aliens came through the walls, abducted him, took him aboard their spaceship, and did terrible things to him. Okay? Whitley Streeper says it was real. I saw him on the Johnny Carson show. Johnny Carson said, do you think you might have dreamed this? He said, no, it seemed absolutely real. Okay. So, during many of these experiences, which occur, as I say, to a very considerable segment of the population, seem extremely real at the time. What causes hallucination? Well, the Encyclopedia of Psychology that I was reading says extreme depression, an extreme experience of loss, of alienation. Surely the disciples, after the death of their leader, as Dr. Craig said, uh, would have been experiencing precisely those severe psychological symptoms that would induce such hallucination. Okay, well, uh, he says finally that, uh, once again, that, uh, uh, that the genre of the stories uh, about UFOs and whatnot are not legendary. Yes, they are. They are indeed. Uh, if you doubt that, I strongly recommend a book to you by Dr. Curtis Peebles called Watch the Sky which is precisely a chronicling of the growth of the UFO legend since World War II. Remember, the UFO legends did not begin to accumulate except since 1947 within the lifetime of eyewitnesses that are alive today. 
Consider the entire literature of legends that grew up around the so-called Flight 19. You ever heard of the Bermuda Triangle? That weird area in the Atlantic where supposedly airplanes and whatnot have disappeared? An entire literature of legends had grown up around the disappearance in December of 1945 of Flight 19, the Avenger dive bombers that disappeared in December of 1945. So, there is, again, overwhelming reason to say that yes, legends do grow, they do spread in a very short period of time, often with the connivance, not often with the connivance of eyewitnesses. Consider the story that flying saucers crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Many of the so-called eyewitnesses, many people who were there on the scene, have helped spread the legend. Why? Because, as we know, memory is horribly, horribly fallible. Horribly fallible. Finally, Dr. Craig said that uh, the disciples, after they had, had an experience of the risen Jesus, would only have thought that he had been taken up into uh, heaven immediately and not had been resurrected. Once again, Jesus' entire ministry was a ministry in which he challenged the Orthodox establishment. Everything in the Bible which reports the tradition says that he was an, an unorthodox, a heretical figure. Uh, besides, the entire zeitgeist of the time, the entire period that Jesus lived was a period of overwhelming apocalyptic expectation. Overwhelming apocalyptic expectation. I will simply have to reiterate my claim that I made earlier. I do not see an unbridgeable conceptual chasm between belief in the resurrection of the dead at the end of time and the belief that the resurrection of Jesus was the first eschatological event initiating the new age, initiating the eschatological age. Okay. Again, I demand of Dr. Craig, if he insists that this is uh, a, a far too great a conceptual shift to be achieved naturalistically, what are his criteria? How can we tell when we have something which is so great that it cannot even be a paradigm shift? Okay, well, I think that pretty much sums up my responses so far. Thank you very much. We will now have the second rebuttal, eight minutes. First, Dr. William Lane Craig. Let me begin by reviewing those reasons that I offered in my first speech for why I am a Christian and see how Dr. Parsons responded. First, I offered the evidence for a creator of the universe, and it's remarkable that nothing has been said about this in tonight's debate. It seems to me that we have every reason tonight to believe that there is a personal creator of the universe who brought the universe into being. And that's especially relevant then when we come to assess Jesus' claims to be the personal revelation of this God. Uh, I think it makes those claims even more credible. Uh, then I offered the evidence for the resurrection, and we'll say something about that in a moment. My third point was the personal experience of God, and here Dr. Parsons responded that he has searched for God and not found God. Well, let me respond in two ways to that. First of all, that doesn't do anything to invalidate my personal experience of God. That doesn't do anything to show that God hasn't touched my life and that, therefore, I'm not justified in believing that God exists on the basis of that experience. But secondly, Jesus of Nazareth said that anyone who is seeking and searching for God will ultimately in the end find God if they seek for him with an open heart and an open mind. He said, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened, ask and it will be given to you. For everyone who seeks, finds him who knocks, the door shall be opened and to him who asks it shall be given. So I would just encourage Dr. Parsons to keep on seeking, to keep on knocking, to keep on asking and I believe that God will answer that. You know, if I just may say again, God loves each one of us. He wants us to come to know him. And if we will simply open our hearts to his grace and his love, I believe that we can find him as a reality. He, he's not hiding. Uh, he wants us to come to know him. Now, finally, what about the point that if God does not exist, then there is no meaning in life? Dr. Parsons says, what about Bertrand Russell? You mean to say Russell's life was meaningless? Russell himself said this. It's the atheists themselves who say that without God, life is absurd, without meaning or value. Listen to Russell's own words. This is what he said. Man, listen to Russell's words. Man is the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving. His origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, 
are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. All the labors of all the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. The whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the ruins of a, uh, uh, beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. No philosophy which rejects these truths can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only upon the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul habitation henceforth be safely built. It is the atheists themselves who have recognized the absurdity of life if there isn't a God. And the good news, I think, of the gospel and uh, of the evidence is that there is a personal creator of the universe that we can come to know. Now, what about that area of, uh, or the, the reasons for not believing in Christianity? Here, Dr. Parsons responded to my statement uh, about Christianity being good, that he thinks God doesn't have the right to take life. Well, I guess I simply disagree. God is the creator, the author, the sustainer of life, has the right to give it and take it as he sees fit. I think we simply have a difference of opinion on this. Secondly, what about Christianity being good down through history? I said Christianity has a good track record. He says, well, why say Christianity is the greatest influence for good? Now, wait a minute. He's the one who has to bear the burden of proof here. He's the one who said Christianity was bad. So he's got to show why the Christian influence has not been good. Uh, all I have to do is show that it has, and it certainly has been. Moreover, I said Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus uh, is the person to whom we must look for our example, and he didn't deny the point. Finally, with respect to the doctrine of hell, he said anyone who would reject God as a lunatic, and lunatics deserve uh, mercy. What I would say here is that God's, the demands of God's justice must be met. God is a holy God, cannot simply blink at sin. Otherwise, we don't live in a moral universe, and therefore sin must be punished. Thus, we are morally obligated to believe in God. We are morally obligated to worship him and to love him as the supreme source of goodness and truth. But we have the freedom to disobey, in which we have to bear the consequences. Just as when one of my children has a moral obligation to do what I say, but they have the freedom to disobey, in which case they're disciplined. Now, what about the resurrection of Jesus? We really disagree on this idea that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And what, look what he said in his last speech. It's just common sense. Boy, your antenna should go up immediately when somebody makes that kind of appeal because that means there's a want of an argument here. There's no argument as to why that's true. On the contrary, what I said, the reason these strange claims are not accepted is not because of the lack of extraordinary evidence. It's because they're ad hoc. But in the case of Jesus, such explanations are not ad hoc. He says Bayes' theorem shows these to be improbable. Not at all. There is no improbability in the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead. What is improbable is the hypothesis Jesus rose naturally from the dead. I agree that that is highly improbable, but it is not improbable that God raised Jesus from the dead. And we've already seen that there's good evidence to believe that God exists. Now, what about the Gospels specifically? I argue that the Gospels are generally historically reliable, and he responded, but much more hangs upon the Gospels than it does on Tacitus and Pliny and other ancient historians. Sure, of course I admit that, but the amount that hangs on the truth of a narrative has absolutely nothing to do with the truth or falsity of the narrative, whether it's credible or incredible or not. So that's simply irrelevant to say much hangs on this. Of course much does, but that doesn't affect that the narrative is basically credible. And I argue that the majority of New Testament critics today who are experts in this field accept the appearances, the empty tomb, and the origin of Christian faith. Now, Dr. Parsons in the last speech says, I do agree that the disciples experienced appearances of Jesus, but I would say that these were just hallucinations. But again, I want to recur to the fact hallucinations can't explain the physicality of these appearances as they occurred, the number and the variety, it's not just one UFO abductee, it's groups of people, numbers of people, unbelievers, skeptics, believers who saw Jesus. Hallucinations can't accommodate that diversity. I also argued that it wouldn't have led to belief in Jesus' resurrection because the Jewish beliefs about the afterlife said that the resurrection only occurred after the end of the world, not within history. So they wouldn't have come to believe that. Rather, given their Jewish frame of thinking, what they would have believed, had they hallucinated, is God has translated Jesus into heaven, into paradise, and there he's appearing to us. If they had a hallucination, that's what a Jew would believe. 
not the contrary to Jewish thinking belief that he had been raised from the dead. Um, and again, of course, hallucinations cannot explain the empty tomb. You have to cook up some independent hypothesis to explain the empty tomb after you've tried to use hallucinations. What about the empty tomb? I, I don't see that he responded to my points about how it's surprising that women would have discovered the tomb. Let me just mention a couple of other points in favor of the empty tomb story. Number one, it is found in a very old source, which is used by Mark, our earliest Gospels, and that mitigates the possibility of legendary development. Secondly, it lacks any signs of legendary development compared to, say, the apocryphal accounts. Is that a zero? Oh, so I'm out of time. Okay. Uh, and finally, the Jewish polemic, uh, earliest propaganda presupposes the empty tomb. They said the disciples stole the body, which presupposes the body was gone. So I think we have good reason to believe in the resurrection of Jesus and, and uh, that he was who he claimed to be. A second rebuttal from Dr. Keith Parsons. Uh, Dr. Craig began by uh, wondering why I did not address the issue of uh, God being creator of the universe. The reason why is that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here this evening. The issue this evening is Christianity. One may be a theist, as Jews and Muslims are, and believe that there is a creator of the universe without believing in Christianity. If Professor Craig wants to schedule a debate with me on atheism versus theism in which we discuss this issue, I am open for such an arrangement at any time in the future. I'll be happy to discuss the creation, uh, I'll be happy to discuss the fallacies and the sophistries and his various arguments there uh, at some future time. Let's get back to personal experience. Uh, personal experience, he says, uh, my lack of experience does not uh, indicate that uh, his experiences are invalid. But remember, once again, in his, all of his speeches and all of his apologetic, Professor Craig offers his personal experiences as evidence for people like me, as apologetic. Okay, It's not simply that he's validating his own personal experience. He's offering as, as evidence something that I should take seriously, that I should believe. Why? Why should I? Why should I? Why should I take that more seriously than people's experience of ghosts, demons, leprechauns, whatever? Uh, I see no reason why. Now, once again, he says, and I noticed it got some applause, uh, he said that Jesus says, Seek and ye shall find. That's what Jesus says. Well, I thought I didn't find, so Jesus is wrong. Okay, simple as that. Uh, afraid so. Okay, uh, then he quotes selectively from Bertrand Russell about the meaninglessness of, the meaninglessness of life. But if you would notice, if you paid close attention to what he was saying, the meaninglessness that Bertrand Russell was addressing was the sorts of expectations that theists have about a grand, meaningful cosmos that somehow vouchsafes us some meaning baloney. If you would read the wider works of Bertrand Russell, such as The Conquest of Happiness, you would see that for Bertrand Russell, life was rich, full, meaningful. What makes my life meaningful? Well, one of the things that makes life meaningful is friendship. I enjoy a number of wonderful friends, good, loving relationships, okay? Fortunately, I've enjoyed a number of wonderful, loving relationships. Having interesting work to do. Now, Bertrand Russell certainly had interesting work to do. Uh, much of his work late in life, when he was 92 years old, he was arrested for protesting against uh, nuclear weapons. Now, again, folks, I would have to say, this is prima facie evidence of meaning. If Professor Craig insists that this is not meaningful in life, I insist again he is using a tendentious and a question-begging definition of meaningfulness. One which would be given by a theist, but not by me, not by Bertrand Russell. Uh, so, uh, again, the fact that Bertrand Russell says that theistic expectations of meaninglessness are not to be met does not show that in a simpler, more direct sense of the meaningfulness of life, that his life was not meaningful. It was meaningful in every conceivable, reasonable, rational sense. Okay, uh, uh, he, let's talk about, um, says God has no right to, uh, I said that God has no right to take a life, and he says, I just plump, I just assert that God has the right. But again, folks, I did not just simply assert that. I appeal to our common intuition. I appeal to basic, I, I, I brought up a thought experiment, which he did not reply to in any way whatsoever. My thought experiment was, imagine that you created a sentient race of beings with feelings and passions and concerns. Would you have the right to go and slaughter them whenever you wanted to? You were their creator. Could you snuff out their lives, cause them anguish? whatever you wanted to. So God has the right to kill innocent babes in arms. He does. Again, folks, I can say nothing but that I cannot believe in such a monster. 
It's not that I do not. It's not that I'm prejudiced against supernatural. I cannot believe in such a monstrosity. Sorry, I'm getting a little loud there. Okay. Uh, he said further that sin must be punished. Why? Why? Uh, why must sin be punished? Why, why is it good? What good would it do for Hitler and Stalin to be suffering torment right now? What good would it do? Why? Well, I mean, what good does it do to just because someone has committed a terrible, atrocious act, why then inflict pain upon them after the act has already been done? Why do we have punishment? We have punishment because we want to keep people from doing terrible things. That's why we have punishment. A purely retributive idea of punishment is barbarous. Okay, once again, get back to the resurrection here. Uh, he says that the difference between uh, all these things I talk about, UFOs and the resurrection accounts, are that UFO accounts are entirely ad hoc. Again, Professor Craig must be using the term ad hoc in some way which I have never heard philosophers use. I do wish that he would explain to me how is the resurrection of Jesus not ad hoc and reports of uh, UFOs are. Somebody sees strange lights in the sky. These lights do funny things. They zip and they move and they uh, you know, seem to defy the laws of uh, physics, etc. Why not say that these are extraterrestrial spacecraft? How is that more ad hoc than saying that Jesus rose from the dead? I, I, I just, I'm going to wait for an explanation of that. And once again, as I can see it, he has given no reasons whatsoever that I can tell for dismissing our deep intuitions, which again, as I say, are backed up by one of the salient positions in the philosophy of science, Bayesian confirmation theory, which says that when we evaluate claims, we must evaluate them in the light of prior probability. Now folks, suppose I told you that I was stranded on a desert island, and I wrote a note to be helped, and uh, please save me, and I put it in a bottle, and I threw it out in the sea, okay? And suppose this was in the South Pacific. Now suppose ten years later, while you know, swimming in the surf in Galveston, that very bottle washes up to me, okay? Now, there's nothing in that scenario I just gave you that violates the laws of nature or that is physically impossible. Yet we would all, I'm sure, demand very good reason before we would believe somebody who tells, tells such a story. A fortiori, all the more are we going to demand good reason to believe something that is physically impossible. A resuscitation of the dead is physically impossible. The laws of thermodynamics tell us what happens to a dead body. It's not going to come to life again, ever, period. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> to say that it does, and then to say that it has all these marvelous properties, passing through walls, etc., that's even more extraordinary. Now, again, folks, if you believe things like that, if you, if you do accept them, and you don't ex expect a higher level of proof than you do for most things, uh, I've got this bridge I'd like to sell you up in uh, Brooklyn, and uh, it's been in my family a long time. I'd be happy to sell it to you. Okay, uh, hallucinations, once again, he says, cannot explain the physicality of the resurrection. Uh, there's a wonderful article in the New York Review of Books just came out about uh, about uh, how people have experienced recently supposedly alien uh, alien uh, abduction. Again, I cannot emphasize too much the physicality, the overwhelming sense that this is real, that it's actually happening. It's not a dream. It's not a delusion. The people that have experienced these things are extremely positive that this really happened. Okay? And how do they explain uh, all sorts of things? Well, they explain it the same way Christians do. You invoke an ad hoc miracle uh, to explain away any difficulty. Okay, finally, the empty tomb. What's the oldest empty tomb tradition? The oldest empty tomb tradition, according to biblical scholar, the Reg scholar Reginald Fuller, was the discovery of the empty tomb by Mary Magdalene on Easter morning. Who is Mary Magdalene? Why should we trust her? It was said in the Bible that Jesus drove seven demons out of her, seven devils. Does this indicate a reliable personality to you? Well, I'm not, I don't know. Finally, let's see, I think I've got zero time left. Thank you very much. Question and answer. We have some mics that are laid down on the aisles, these two aisles. Sorry about you guys that came in late. It serves you right. But um, line up the mics. We've got about 15 minutes for some questions. And then we'll have two five-minute closings from Dr. Craig and Dr. Parsons. So uh, hang in there. We've got about another 35 minutes. You guys are doing great. Dr. Craig, let me...
Dr. Craig, let me begin with this uh, question of the uh, legend. Is not the uh, post-resurrection appearance of Jesus a legend? Why not? Well, uh, I don't think that the appearance stories are, are legendary, although I don't think that this is a, a really a key point in the debate tonight because you admit, Dr. Parsons, that they did have these experiences. The, the question is the nature now of the experiences or the explanation of the experience, which is the best explanation that they were veridical or that they were hallucinatory. That, that seems to me to be the issue. But the argument against legend was based on the fact that normally legends don't accrue that rapidly, that the legends take centuries to develop, and, and therefore it's unlikely that these are um, legendary accounts. I would say once again there are obvious counterexamples to that claim. Uh, one of my favorite counterexamples is the famous Darwin legend. Uh, you recall that uh, Darwin died in 1882, uh, April 19th, I believe that it was. Almost immediately, the legend began that Darwin, on his deathbed, had confessed his uh, belief in Christ and had renounced his atheistic, godless theory of evolution. Uh, almost immediately, that story began. It was preached from pulpits. T.H. Uh, Huxley and others, members of the Darwin family, attempted to squelch this story. Within 30 years, one Lady Hope published an article in which she claimed to have interviewed Darwin in the months before his death and claimed that at that time that he had confessed that he uh, did not believe in evolution and that he believed in God and he regretted evolution, all this sort of thing. None of that took place. All these stories spread like wildfire through the evangelical publication spread, might I say, by good Christians, spread by good evangelical Christians who never even bothered to check with the eyewitnesses, namely Francis Darwin and others who were present. To the end of his life, Frank, uh, Leonard Darwin, the last of the Darwin children, denounced Lady Hope's story as a lie, a hallucination, and whatever. It had no effect upon preventing yeah. the spread of this see, infamous legend. See, I, I think that this is, again, a mistake of genre. I'm not talking about lies or, or rumors or so forth. What this quotation from A.N. Sherwin-White says, that I quoted from his book, Roman Society and Roman Law in the New Testament, is the following. The two generations is too short a time span to allow legendary tendencies to wipe out the hard core of oral tradition. So what he's talking about is where you have an oral tradition that is being passed on, and then it gets reshaped and retold and modified over the years and over the decades, and he's, he's saying that when you look at how that happens, that doesn't, that, that, that wholesale reshaping of oral tradition can't happen in less than two generations so that the historical memory is lost. That, that's the point he's making. And that's not countered by examples of things like, you know, the false stories of Darwin's deathbed conversion and so forth. But, but as I say, I don't think that this is really the central issue between us because you do admit these early disciples had some kind of dramatic transformative experience that led them to believe now that their master was alive again, that he was not dead, that he was risen from the dead. And that's a, I'm sure you'd admit again too, this is an extraordinary belief that's very un-Jewish. It, it's, it's very odd, and, and so we want to know, one of the points that I'm making is we want to know what's the origin of these men coming up with this belief, which they believe so strongly and so sincerely that they were willing to go to these hideous deaths for it. Why do you believe that it could not have been a hallucination? Surely you know from the things I've said and from the extant literature on the nature of hallucination, which I assume you've investigated, uh, that hallucinations, as I've said repeatedly this evening, uh, are often experienced by people as being extremely real. Furthermore, as I said in one of my rebuttals, precisely the conditions under which we expect people to have hallucinations are those which undoubtedly were being experienced by the disciples. Mm -hmm. An extreme sense of alienation, an extreme sense of loss, a terrible reactive depression. Uh, it's been pointed out many times that, gosh, one-third to two, over one-half of the people who have been bereaved will have a waking hallucination of their loved ones that they have lost. Yeah, but and, then they, they don't conclude that they're risen from the dead as a result of that. Well, <laughs> you know, why not? Uh, well, but they don't. I mean, I, remember, I, I, remember, I'm willing to... Remember, of course, of course they don't. Uh, they don't conclude that they are, they are risen. Well, I'm not sure. We'd have to check, have to check and see. 
Uh, there are many people that do believe that people are risen from the dead. Uh, once again, in the present day and age, uh, there are people that have encountered the risen Elvis, as I say, uh, over and over again. Yeah, uh, but don't you know, know, in and, the uh, and, and so there are many people. But we have to remember the specific context in which the yes. disciples were existing. Exactly, and that's why it's things. misleading to use these Elvis sorts of analogies. You need to ah, show the parallels. Ah. Uh, the, the, but the, the day and age of uh, the disciples was very much like ours in the sense that there was tremendous apocalyptic or eschatological uh, expectations. Yes, that's right. Okay. Some people even believe that John the Baptist was the expected Messiah. This is why the Gospels were at such pains to indicate, you know, the submission of John the Baptist to Jesus. So there was tremendous apocalyptic expectation. Right. The final age was at hand. Uh, God would intervene decisively in history to overthrow yeah. the Roman overlord. Right. This sort of thing. They okay. were hoping for the political Messiah who would throw off Rome. Rome expectation, why, once again, would it be beyond the bounds of belief to think that the disciples could have an experience of their master alive again, a very realistic seeming yeah. experience, and in the process of dealing with this experience come to say he is risen from the dead, that the new well, age is at hand. Be because, remember what I said, that the Jewish expectations, as you said, were for a political deliverer and messiah who would throw off the yoke of Rome, who would deliver Israel and this bondage under which they were chafing. And the idea then that Jesus would be crucified, would be executed as a common criminal, would put a question mark behind any kind of messianic faith that they might have had in him. It, and it wasn't just that he was dead. I mean, that was bad enough. But that according to Old Testament law in Deuteronomy, his execution as a criminal showed that he was, in fact, a heretic. Mm -hmm. He was a man under the curse of God, that for three years, in effect, they had, the Pharisees had been right. They had been following a, a Jewish schismatic, a man under God's curse. And, and then, as I said, the, the, the end of the world had to occur first before the resurrection of the dead would occur. And it was always a general resurrection. Everybody would come out of the graves, you know, together. And so, if they had a hallucination, and let me concede that people who are bereaved and, and in experiencing mourning and loss might have, say, hallucinations of the, the, the dead one. Maybe Mary Magdalene or somebody, say, hallucinated Jesus. Given hallucinations as projections of the mind don't contain anything that's not already in the mind. They are projections of the contents of, of the mind. So, given their Jewish expectations and frame of mind, if they were to hallucinate Jesus, they would see visions of Jesus in glory, in Abraham's bosom, where the righteous dead went to depart, to be with God. And at most, that would have led to the belief that Jesus had been assumed into heaven, he had been translated into heaven, which is a totally different category in Jewish thinking from resurrection from the dead. So I don't think that even if I concede that they hallucinated, which I'm, I'm not ready to concede, but even if they did, I don't think it would lead to this proclamation, he is risen from the dead. We read uh, Bishop uh, Shelby Spong's book, uh, Resurrection, Myth of Reality. I haven't read Spong because, frankly, I mean, I... You ought to debate him. I, I'd, I'd like to. to. I'd, 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 I'd like to very much. But I, I think Spong is a popularizer oh, yeah. of more credible scholarly work, which I have read and, mm -hmm. and tried to interact with. On, on the, on the, so let me, on let the me, hallucination... Let me, let me pursue a point, if All I may, right. uh, on that. Uh, the reason I read Spong is this. Uh, couldn't there have been a process? Couldn't there have been an initial experience of a hallucination, an extremely real seeming experience in which, you know, several apostles, uh, you know, had a hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucination, which once again, psychologists tell us, is extremely real, as real as I'm seeing you guys right now, they say. Uh, and uh, when they had that experience, and then couldn't there have been a period of time in which, as Shelby Spong says, they thought this over. They reflected on this experience of the of, of, of the you know, resurrected Jesus or the resuscitated Jesus, whatever that they had experienced in the hallucination. They reflected on this. They thought about this. They worked it out in the smithy of their souls, as Spawn says. Mm -hmm. And eventually, the best sense they could make of it is that Jesus was risen from the dead, and that the new age, the apocalyptic age, which Jesus did preach, as far as we can tell, going by the earliest Markan account, Jesus did have apocalyptic content. The era, era was rife with apocalyptic content. Why then couldn't they yeah. see his resurrection as the first prefiguring the general resurrection? Once again, Dr. Craig, I simply did not see such a massive conceptual shift here yeah. that we couldn't have something like a paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts do occur. Yeah, and it's a cumulative case. I mean, what I'm offering here are, are three independent pieces of evidence which I think right. cumulatively have force. And with respect to the, the paradigm shift, 
it just seems to me that given the Jewish frame of thought and beliefs about the afterlife, that if they were to hallucinate Jesus, the best explanation of what a Jew would believe in having such an experience would not be he is risen from the dead. That was a, that was an un-Jewish way of thinking. It, it's in hindsight that we look back and, and say, oh, they might have believed that. But that's not the way I think a first century Jew would have interpreted. I mean, it would have involved spiritualizing the kingdom of God mm. rather than thinking of it as, you know, physically coming. And as I said, I'm not prepared to grant that these were hallucinations because you, you, you can't show any hallucination that fits the model of the resurrection appearances in all respects. And you might pick one hallucination that fits one aspect. Here's another hallucination that fits another aspect. But there isn't anything that fits all of these in terms of the diversity, the range of people involved, and, and so forth. I mean, for example, James, Jesus' younger brother, we have good reason to believe he was not a believer in Jesus during his lifetime. And yet we know also we have good testimony that he was a firm believer and leader of the New Testament church afterwards. Now, how do you explain the fact of James' conversion from being an unbeliever to being prepared to die? And he did die, Josephus tells us. James died for his belief that his older brother was the Lord. Now, what would cause you or me to believe your brother is the Lord? You know, apart from what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, then he appeared to James. And you can't write that off as hallucinatory because James was an unbeliever. Hmm. And similarly, Paul, you know, was an unbeliever. So it's this diversity that I think makes the hallucination hypothesis less credible. Can we come to some claims? You had talked about okay. the idea of extraordinary claims require extraordinary yeah, evidence. Yes, indeed. The question I've got is, what would that extraordinary evidence be in the first century? You didn't have video cameras, you didn't have scientific tests, so what would that look like? If you were looking for extraordinary evidence. What would, gosh, you know, that makes it especially difficult, of course, right? It makes it especially difficult in, in, in uh, justifying any miraculous claims from uh, from those days. And I think that's not a problem for me in any sense at all. That's a problem for the people who are claiming the miracle. The paucity of evidence, you know. Uh, if there had been a video camera there at the at the uh, door of the tomb, you know, and we could see the angel coming down, rolling aside the uh, the, the big stone, that sort of thing. Uh, well, I would say probably, first of all, it was made in the Walt Disney studio. That would be my first hypothesis. Uh, you know, that uh, Steven Spielberg has something to do with it, you know. Gospel of Matthew is incredibly Spielbergian. I mean, you ought to make a movie of it, okay. But, uh, you know, that's the, uh, that would be my first hypothesis. But, you know, you raise a legitimate issue, but, you know, I'd simply have to point out that's not a problem for me. That's a problem for anybody who wants to claim a miracle. T.H. Huxley, in a marvelous classic essay written in 1890-something, uh, he said, look, there are all sorts of sources that we have from ancient times that include eyewitnesses saying, I was there when Charlemagne cured the leper. Okay? If we believe all those stories, we would be incredibly credulous people. Remember that wonderful thing in Shakespeare? Uh, I love the quote from Shakespeare from uh, Macbeth. Remember the thing in Shakespeare and Julius Caesar in which he's talking about, uh, you know, that uh, against the capital I saw a lion walking and I saw a common slave, you know him well by sight, uh, that he was emanating fire, this sort of thing. Well... Again, these sorts of stories came from sober, secular, pagan, or whatever historians of ancient times. If we believed all of those stories, once again, uh, I've got some Dr. Parsons patent miracle cure that I would like to save you. I just need to go, some, go out and bottle it up, you know, for a few minutes and bring it back into you, and I would like to save you that. We would be incredibly credulous to believe all this. Well, it, these cases have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Of you course. can't dismiss the resurrection narratives on the basis that some other spurious miracle stories have occurred. You have to assess each one on its own merits. And what I fear from your response is that this watchword, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, is really just an excuse for an a priori rejection of the miraculous. Because you, you weren't, or you didn't give any sort of evidence that would satisfy you with respect to one of these extraordinary claims. It made it sound like to me you were saying, that nothing would convince you. Oh, no, 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 all sorts of things would convince you. Well, with respect to the resurrection, though, I mean, you even you said if there was a video camera, you'd say it was a fake stone that was mm. rolled away. You know, I mean, mm. what, what sort of... What be the, sort of, would be the more reasonable hypothesis? Under the but, well, but see, that's what I fear. It is. It's, uh -huh. just an, it's just an a priori rejection of the miraculous here. You're, you're not... There isn't any kind of literary testimony, historical testimony that mm -hmm. could convince you. Once again, it's, 
what uh, common sense. Let me appeal to court cases. Okay, in court, on what basis do we believe certain testimony? Okay, well, we believe testimony often on the basis of how likely or unlikely we think it is that somebody is telling the truth on the basis of all sorts of surrounding circumstances. Now, in court case, generally speaking, uh, there are no claims to supernatural action. There are no claims to anything occurring which was physically impossible or against the laws of nature, however one wants to phrase it, you know, that sort of thing. Yet we still judge guilt or innocence, send people to the uh, to, to, to execution or not, on the basis of what we consider to be likely or unlikely on the, on, on, the, on the given circumstances, that sort of thing. So once again, this extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence in no way implies a bias against the supernatural. It's well, simply, it's 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 simply uh, an application of a rule which we use in our daily lives. But, but you're saying that these, when you say extraordinary, really what you're saying is no amount of evidence would co convince me of these extraordinary claims. Sure it would. If uh, tomorrow morning, immediately after breakfast, suddenly there was an earthquake, you know, and a silvery light shone in the sky and the leaves dropped from the trees, and I dashed outside and there, towering over us like a hundred Everest, was this giant figure with lightning playing around his Michelangeloid face, and he pointed down and saying, Be assured, Keith M. Parsons, that I do in fact exist and I'm sick of your logic chopping. Uh, Dr. Craig, I would join you in the pew of the church, in the front pew of the church the next Sunday. Uh, you, uh, so, uh, you know, be going to the question and answer period. We're going to go to the question and answer period, so we'll be going you, to the microphone. You, 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 don't think, you don't think that you would have said, boy, I was having a hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you saw it too, you know, then, <laughs> well, yes, but, you know, but that's the thing. I'm assuming this is what about 500 brethren? I'm assuming, I'm assuming 500 brethren, uh, you know, uh, but see, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, that it's on the evening news, that everybody on the uh -huh. earth goes out to see it, you know, that sort of thing. In that okay. case, it would be like David Hume says, that there was a darkness over the earth for eight days recorded in all nations and all languages, that sort of thing, you know. Uh, okay. In that case, yes, if that's a hallucination, then everything's all a right. hallucination. Let, let me then see how you would respond to my alternative analysis, because quite honestly, I have thought about this idea of extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And, and that has a sort of commonsensical appeal, as you say, but as I think about it, it, I can't think of any good argument for that, to think why an extraordinary claim to be believed needs extraordinary evidence. And it seems to me that that claim is a, is a misexpression of what is true, namely, that appeals to the miraculous are ad hoc and therefore are not the best explanation in many cases. For example, if the criminal you spoke of in the court were to say, well, God miraculously uh, struck this person dead. It wasn't me who killed him with the knife. It was God who struck him miraculously dead. We would be skeptical, not because that's an extraordinary claim, mm -hmm. but because it's ad hoc, it's contrived. But with respect to the resurrection of Jesus, to say he is risen from the dead or God raised him from the dead, isn't ad hoc in the context of Jesus' own unparalleled life and teachings, claims to be the Son of God and, and so forth, and the fact that this interpretation is found in the original documents, it seems to me that there, that claim is more plausible than just arbitrary appeals to the miraculous saying, oh, well, God did it. Well, yeah, once again, you know, what you just said militates against the other argument that you gave me. If it is plausible, if it does follow from the things that Jesus said, if it does fit in the story, mm. well, then once again, wouldn't the expectations in the disciples' mind be for that sort of thing to happen? Yeah, well, so it seems to me that there is a contradiction, or at least a, a, a tension that needs to yeah. be spelled out uh, between those two aspects of your appeal there. You know, so, yeah. uh, you know, that's the, that's, that's the thing. Yeah. Let's go to the question and answer period, okay, and great. I apologize in advance for all of you that would like to ask a question will not be able to do so. Let me give you some ground rules. If it turns into a sermon, I will cut you off. As a talk show host, I know how to do that. <laughs> we'll start right there. No sermon. Um, Edward Tabash from uh, Beverly Hills, California. Dr. Craig, if in fact the witnessing of the resurrection was so essential to people being able to believe in and spread the word of Jesus' divinity, then why are we moderns denied the same evidence that manifested to the ancients? Why can't somebody be resurrected today by God so that us non-believers could see this miraculous evidence? Why not part of Hugh C's and, 
and have the earth stand still, a yeah. few flaming chariots. Isn't it unfair for our salvation to depend on evidence of the miraculous that was never properly chronicled in primitive times? Okay, Eddie, you've asked this question before. Let me try to, to, to get at this <laughs> as clear as I can. Um, really, the question you're raising is what Lessing called the broad, ugly ditch between the contingent facts of history and the necessary claims of religion. And what Lessing was saying is, how can these life-changing and, and uh, life-shattering claims of religion, salvation and so forth, these eternal claims, rest upon the apprehension of contingent facts of history? And I agree that that's a problem, and that is why I am not an evidentialist. I do not think that uh, you have to have historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus or the Gospels and so forth to rationally believe. On the contrary, I think that it is on the basis of the inner witness of God's Spirit that we have adequate grounds for knowing the Christian faith to be true and for rationally believing in Christ, just as I did when I first heard the message of Christ as I described. So, I would answer lesson with what Kierkegaard said, that through the Spirit of God, every generation is contemporaneous with the eyewitnesses. And that if we will attend to that, we will have adequate grounds for knowing that Jesus is risen from the dead because he can be experienced as a living reality in our own lives, whether we have the time, the leisure, the training, and the opportunity to conduct a historical investigation of the evidence or not. Okay, I believe I get a uh, response now. Uh, Eddie, I think you're right. Uh, I mean, if, if our eternal destiny depends upon uh, whether we believe in God or not, he owes us some flaming chariots. He owes us some burning bushes. He should make it, I mean, if we're going to spend eternity in hell if we don't believe in him, then he should make it blindingly, undeniably obvious that he exists. He has a responsibility to do so. We're important enough. Uh, eternal punishment is bad enough. Uh, he ought to make it uh, so that you know, we weak human beings with our powers of self-deception cannot fool ourselves. I want a burning bush! <laughs> Question back here. Carlos Estrada, First Baptist uh, Coppell. My question is for Dr. Parsons. You said you wanted a definition of the meaning of life. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you said that life is meaningful just by having friendships and finding, exploring, such as Einstein, and that his life is meaningless. Well, what is the point of life to explore and find new worlds if all who will ex exist and experience it will just end up dead, six foot under? Oh, well. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not oh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wrap it up. It's such a good question. I want to jump right in. Because with God, with Jesus Christ, God gives us an everlasting life, therefore giving it meaning. I'm very big question. Let me say, though, that I take precisely the opposite view. Martin Heidegger, who was a German philosopher that said almost everything, almost everything he said was incomprehensible, said one thing that I really liked. He said, it is the fact that life is finite. It is the fact that we shall die that gives our life meaning, that gives us the responsibility of creating meaning in our lives. Yes, we only live 70 years. Okay? Seventy years, that's about it. Each day is important. Each day that you let slip by without doing something meaningful in your life is a day that is gone forever. Okay? All the more, the fact that we shall die means all the more that we have the responsibility of squeezing out of every moment of life, every day of life, squeezing as much meaning and significance as we can get. And, uh, you know, it took me 40 some odd years to realize that, but by golly, that's what I'm doing now. Well, I think it's really odd to talk about, I have the responsibility to squeeze meaning out of life. Responsible to whom? Uh, okay, well, then in that case I would say, why, uh, why is it any different whether somebody acts responsibly or irresponsibly? Your destiny is unrelated to how you act. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, for example, you said Russell campaigned against the use of nuclear weapons. Mankind will be wiped out anyway in the heat death of the universe. Uh, it really ultimately makes no difference whether mankind ever existed or not, whether one campaigned against nuclear war or one just lived in self-indulgence and, and hedonism. So it does seem to me that, that Heidegger is quite wrong here, that Sartre and Camus and others were correct, that 
ultimately, in the absence of, of God, life becomes absurd. There isn't any objective meaning to life, and the little meanings and projects we invent to fill our lives are really just pretense. They're not really objective meanings. Question over here. Hi, my name is Martina, and I attend the North Texas Church of Free Thought, and I have a comment for Dr. Craig. I am a non-believer and an atheist, and I'm somewhat offended, Dr. Craig, at your statement that we are immoral. I that we are what? That we are immoral. You made that statement. Did I? I have a, I have a son, and teach him mm -hmm. right from wrong because it is the right thing to do, not because some supernatural entity tells me to do this. If the Christians in this room get nothing else out of this debate, let them realize that atheists are just as kind and loving, if not more so, than Christians would be or aspire to be. Yeah, I didn't say that. I think you misunderstood me. Maybe I did, but I really yeah, didn't because say I, I that. never said or, or intended or believed that atheists are immoral. What I said is that if God doesn't exist, then even if right or wrong, right and wrong exists, which I think is doubtful on an atheistic view, it seems to me that in the absence of God, there isn't any objective right and wrong. There are just various socio-cultural values that have evolved in different societies and different cultures. That, spin-offs of socio-biological evolution, but even if they were right and wrong, what I said is, is that it doesn't really matter how you live because your destiny is unrelated to your behavior. The good man ends up no different than the evil man. There's no difference between the Mother Teresa and the Joseph Stalin. So I'm not saying that atheists are immoral. By no means. What I was saying is that in the absence of God, uh, morality becomes, in a sense, fictitious. It, it, it becomes pointless. There isn't any value in life because it doesn't change anything how you live. You, you all end up the same. Albert Schweitzer wound up dead. Adolf Hitler wound up dead. Does that mean that there was no significance, no very deep, real significance in the difference between those two lives? I would say there is an overwhelming amount of significance. Okay, I can live 70 years, somebody else lives 70 years. How we live those years, to me, is something of overwhelming, precious significance, you know, not to be discounted. The fact that we all do wind up in the grave, how does that in any way diminish or decrease the significance of life as we live it? In fact, I emphasize once again, you know, if you have a finite period of time, if God isn't going to give you happiness in the next life, Folks, you must get your happiness right now. Remember Reverend Ike? Uh, Reverend Ike used to be this guy on TV. He says, I don't want my pie in the sky by and by. I want my pie on earth with ice cream right now. <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you, get your pie, get your ice cream now. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Question back here. I don't believe that uh, God can be proven. I believe that he has to be accepted on faith. But I also... I'm surprised that there hasn't been more talk about Josephus, a historian who did report on the death and burial of Jesus, although he said that the body mysteriously disappeared, uh, which is certainly what a historian would have reported, not being a religious person. Uh, how do you respond to that? Is that not some extraordinary evidence uh, that you're requiring that a historian who had nothing to do with the religious experience would have reported on the death and burial and disappearance of, of Jesus' body? I think that's an address to me. Uh, all I know is that uh, all the scholars that I have read, all of the New Testament scholars, say that that section from Josephus is an interpolation which is put in there by later Christians. And they give several reasons for this. First of all, it fits in, those passages are totally incongruous. They break completely the literary flow of Josephus' writing at that point. Second, no good Orthodox Jew of the day, as Josephus was, I'm going to make the same kind of argument that Dr. Craig would, no Jew of the day would have said those sorts of things about a man, you know. So obviously I'm just going to go with what the overwhelming majority of New Testament scholars that I have read say. In fact, it seems unanimous to me. Uh, they all say that that's a later Christian interpolation. Um, I think that, the, uh, that your information is incorrect here, Dr. Parsons. Um, it's true that the Josephus passage, I think, has been doctored by early Christian copyists, and that's why you have these statements that a no-Orthodox Jew would make, like, he was the Messiah. But nevertheless, the, I think the majority of scholars today would say that there was a Jesus passage in Josephus. Uh, it, it's not incongruous. In fact, it fits in with the two stories on either side of it, uh, which are also verified by Tacitus and another ancient historian, and it also has earmarks of Josephus' own style. 
Uh, but it doesn't say, probably, in the original, that he was risen from the dead. Probably what Josephus reports is something like this. There was, at this time, a man who was Jesus of Nazareth, a wonder worker and teacher, uh, who generated a following. He was believed to perform miracles and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and those who followed him continue to do so to this day. And there's a second reference in Josephus later where he talks about the martyrdom of James, his younger brother, which seems to refer back to this earlier passage, which also indicates that there were two Josephus passages. So we do glean some information about the historical Jesus from Josephus, but nothing that would go to prove the resurrection. Question over here. Yes, um, Dr. Parsons, the question is basically that, um, like the gentleman just said, I believe it's an issue of faith and that you cannot prove it or disprove it. But at some point you inductively looked at the evidence, um, both in terms of natural law, physics, um, uh, physical laws, and, and have your belief that I believe um, in the resurrection of Christ. Now, you, you pointed out quite a bit in terms of the issue of suffering. My question would be that um, Jesus, as God Almighty, why would he permit himself to suffer? Beats me. Oh. I, I, you know, uh, to me, when you ask these questions about Christian theology, uh, people have asked me things like that. I was speaking one time about creationism. And someone said, well, how could there be a fall if, there, if evolution was true? To me, that's like asking how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. I'm afraid I'm just not the person to answer that question. I go back, I heard, I remember hearing a rabbi say one time, said, the idea that, he, that God would send his only son to be killed? Boy, they. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm afraid I can't answer your question, sir. Okay, I'll, I'll just respond this way. Wouldn't that be the perfect response for a world that is suffering greatly, that has suffered from the very beginning in terms of, in terms of time to today, that when people are raped, people are murdered, they know that there's a God who gives them free will to choose right and wrong, and that God does not coerce or force other people to believe in him. Instead, that he came down to earth and he suffered with us and communicating that type of love. I'd rather not suffer at all than have somebody suffer with me. I'd rather, I'd, I'd rather you not beat the pulp out of me uh, than uh, beat me up and then go have yourself beaten up. But then uh, you know, I, I'd just rather not suffer at all. That sounds like the Truman Show to me, where a benevolent person creates a perfect world and, create, and causes a person to live the type of life that he wants to live. What's wrong with a perfect world? I'd love a perfect world. You have not seen the Truman Show, I guess. Yet. What's wrong with it? <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Well, I guess I would just want to respond to what the questioner said at the beginning about he, he just believes this by faith. Uh, if I could give an exhortation to you Christians, I think it's that kind of, that, that's a mask for superficial thinking. And that Christians too often just say, oh, believe it by faith. And I think that just uh, leads to the impression that so many non-Christians have of us that we're intellectually vacuous, that we can't defend our views, that we don't have good reasons for what we believe. Uh, and there's no reason for you to think like that as Christians. There, there's good evidence for both believing that there is a God who exists, and there's good historical evidence for the historicity of the Gospels. What we've only done here tonight is just scratch the surface. I mean, I would encourage you to begin to read and look at some of these issues more deeply, because there's just uh, a huge iceberg beneath the surface, and we've only seen the tip of it tonight in this debate. Question back here. Yes, uh, this is for Dr. Parsons. First of all, I'm going to start praying for you to Thanks, experience I need all the help a miracle in your life because <laughs> I think you really need one. But the question that I have is, how do you explain the many prophecies that have come to pass in scriptures? For instance, Israel becoming a nation again, earthquakes, and in First Timothy, it, I believe it talks about the knowledge of flowing, coming to and, and flow. Or, I mean, if you know that scripture, it talks about knowledge being ever present, growing in the in the last days. How can you explain the last days prophecies coming true? Uh, let me say first of all, thanks for the prayers. I need all the help I can get. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, but uh, you know, once again, as far as prophecy goes, uh, this is a game which uh, I really think uh, just cannot reasonably be played. Uh, uh, Hal Lindsey wrote the late great Planet Earth in 1970. I read it you know back in those days. And, wow, what a great book. The world is just about to come to an end. Wow, 1970, it was. Well, here we are, 28 years later, ain't come to an end yet. Is it going to? No, all the, the so-called fulfillment of prophecies is just a trick. It's totally bogus. It's easy to talk about fulfillment of prophecies after the so-called prophecies have already been fulfilled. The idea that there were prophecies, or the whole idea of prophets as being people who predict the future and thereby confirm God, that is totally alien to the Old Testament concept of a prophet. And prophet in the Old Testament was someone who spoke for God, like Nathan 
who appeared before David and said, Thou art the man. Or like Samuel. The idea that Old Testament prophets are prophecies for someone who, uh, these are people who uh, uh, made predictions about the future which then came true, uh, that's, that's just false. You know, and once again, with the retrospective of history, we can look back and we can read into the record and say, aha, this prophecy was fulfilled, that prophecy was fulfilled. 1948, that prophecy was fulfilled when Israel was formed. But when we start talking about the prophecies uh, of next year or the year after, well, we get awfully vague. It's like the so-called prophecies of Nostradamus. Nostradamus can predict, my friends, if you go to someone who is a believer in Nostradamus, they will tell you how Nostradamus predicts everything perfectly up to 1998, but after that he gets awfully vague, and I'm afraid that's how I find biblical prophecy. Yeah, but... Well, I, I'm also skeptical of a lot of these end-time prophecies, such as Hal Lindsey and so forth, but I, I do think it was part of the role of an Old Testament prophet Part of his role was to predict the future, and it, it stipulated, I believe, in Deuteronomy 13, that if a prophet makes prophecies which fail to come true, then he was to be put to death because he was misleading the people. He was a spurious false prophet speaking, uh, you know, for God as a counterfeit. So, and there were prophecies of the Messiah who would come that I think were fulfilled in Christ. Now, I'm not an Old Testament scholar, so I can't really speak to this with any expertise, but I, I do think that that is an element of Old Testament prophecy that needs to be taken into account. Question of view. Mike Gaynor, uh, Grace Outreach of Plano, Texas. Um, Dr. Parsons, you said earlier uh, tonight that you had you searched for Christ and that you did not find him. Uh, for one, I want to say, well, faith is basically believing in something you know in your heart that exists without physical evidence. And um, Basically, all I can say is that um, speaking in tongues, that's one of the many gifts that you get from, from accepting God through baptism of the Holy Spirit. Explain that. I think it's an good question. Sure. So, glossolalia, speaking in tongues, seems to be purely a psychological phenomenon. It's observed in many cultures and many civilizations and uh, this sort of thing. Uh, I observed it at a Beatles concert uh, that I went to many years ago. Uh, <laughs> The young woman sitting next to me was speaking in tongues, uh, basically, uh, you know, sort of thing. So, you know, I would say that uh, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no evidence that uh, glossolalia itself is an uh, you know, indication of some sort of higher power being manifested upon us. Uh, now, you talk about uh, discovering Christ within myself or once this sort of thing. Well, once again, I just want to know. Um, suppose I get a feeling, okay? Jeez, I get a feeling. Jeez, Jesus died on the cross. What terrible suffering he must have had, uh, and he must have undergone, all this sort of thing. And he did it all for me, and I get a warm, fuzzy feeling inside, okay? How do I know that's just not a warm, fuzzy feeling? How do I know that's not just some psychologically caused warm, fuzzy feeling? How do I know that's the Holy Spirit acting me, in me? How do I tell the difference between the Holy Spirit acting and a warm, fuzzy feeling? I don't know. Maybe Dr. Craig can help me. Um, in a sense, that question could be asked about any kind of apprehension of, 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 uh, that we have. For example, sense intuitions. How do I know that my perceptions of the external world are real? That I'm not just a brain in a vat being stimulated by electrodes to think that I see an external world. Uh, there's no way to get outside your sensory data in order to justify your sensory data. But in the absence of any defeater for those, you simply accept them and that the, the world is a real. And similarly, I would say with respect to the witness of the Holy Spirit, for a person who has come to know God in a personal way, it's not just kind of like a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's not like that. It's more like the reality of a personal presence in your life that wasn't there before. For me, it was like somebody turned on the light that, where there was darkness before. And I just have no reason to think that this is delusory, it, it, it's almost, I, I've called it a self-authenticating experience, that the person who, who has it knows. It's kind of like, I remember before I met my wife, I would often ask married couples, to say, how do you know when you're in love? You know, And they'd say, you just know that when it happens, you just know that you're in love. Well, it's kind of like that, I think, in, in knowing Christ. It, you, you, it's a, it's an, a personal presence and experience that's, that's real. And you don't have any reason to doubt it. But I do want to say with response to the questioner, I just disagree entirely that faith is believing in your heart without physical evidence. That's not the New Testament concept of faith. The, the New Testament concept of faith is that faith is trust. 
Uh, it is commitment. And that is totally consistent with having good evidence and reasons for that commitment and trust. When I had eye surgery a few years ago, I wasn't willing to go under the knife until I had made sure that this doctor was the best corneal surgeon in the United States. And then having determined that, I placed my trust in him and, and, and went under the knife. Similarly, placing your trust in Christ isn't inconsistent at all with having good evidence and, and reasons for believing that God exists, that the Bible is true, that Jesus was who he claimed to be, and so forth. We're now going to move to our closing comments, and I apologize for those of you that wanted to ask questions. Perhaps the uh, participants will be here afterwards to answer your question. Five-minute closing speech, and we'll begin with Dr. William Lane. Okay, and I'm supposed to deliver this, what, sitting here? You can stand over there if you'd like. Oh. Stand up, pick your notes, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, okay. <clears throat> well, uh, let me just try to summarize the threads of the debate, then, I guess, as I see them. I presented three reasons tonight why I am a Christian. First of all was evidence for a personal creator of the universe, and that has not been disputed tonight. Dr. Parsons says he thought it was irrelevant to the debate, but I think it's highly relevant, particularly when it comes to assessing the evidence for the resurrection. Because if you already know that there is a supernatural being, a creator who exists, who's capable of doing something like a miracle, then that makes it all the more plausible to believe in miracle claims like the resurrection. So it is highly relevant. That's what it has to do with Christianity. Uh, with respect, then, to my second argument, the evidence for the resurrection, um, I think I've explained why I think that extraordinary claims don't require extraordinary evidence. What is true about that is that a, a miracle claim is not the best explanation when it's ad hoc, when it's contrived. But when there is a significant religio-historical context in which that miracle claim occurs, then I think it is plausible to avert to the miraculous explanation if it's better than any naturalistic explanation. And when I look at the naturalistic explanations like conspiracy theory, swoon theory, hallucination theory, it seems to me that the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead surpasses these theories in terms of its, its explanatory scope, its explanatory power, its plausibility. It's not ad hoc, and therefore this is the best explanation, that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, with respect to the uh, appearances, we agree that they occurred. The only question is whether or not these were hallucinations. And I, I think that uh, given the diversity and the range of these experiences, it's unlikely they could be hallucinations. Also, it would be very un-Jewish, even if these hallucinations occurred, to interpret them as resurrection from the dead rather than assumption into heaven. And finally, uh, I pointed out that it, the hallucination hypothesis doesn't explain the empty tomb. You still need a, another hypothesis to explain that. The resurrection hypothesis explains both the empty tomb and the appearances, as well as the origin of the Christian faith, and thus has greater explanatory scope, and so is a better explanation. With respect to the empty tomb, Dr. Parsons says, well, why trust Mary Magdalene? Well, very simply this, others could check out what she said. It wasn't just Mary who, who found the tomb empty, but others could see. In fact, it's remarkable that early Christianity originated in the very city where Jesus was crucified and buried. As Wolfhard Pannenberg, my doctoral mentor, stated, even if the empty tomb narratives were totally legendary, the tomb must have been empty when the disciples began to preach the resurrection of Jesus because you couldn't have a movement founded on the resurrection of a dead man flourishing in Jerusalem if everybody knew that the body lay interred in the hillside. So that's why most uh, historical scholars today, uh, the broad spectrum of New, uh, New Testament scholars, think that the tomb was in fact found empty. Finally, the origin of the Christian faith, we saw this couldn't be explained on the basis of Jesus' predictions of his resurrection because the evidence for the empty tomb is greater than the evidence for the predictions. So if you agree that the predictions were historical, then you have to also agree that the appearances in the empty tomb were historical. Uh, and we saw how it contradicted Jewish modes of thinking. Finally, the personal experience of God. Uh, again, I guess I would just say this. If you have not found God in a personal, as a personal reality in your life, do what I did. Pick up the New Testament and begin to read the Gospels and ask yourself, could this really be true? Could there really be a God who loves me? Could Jesus of Nazareth really be the revelation of God to mankind? 
and begin to explore his claims for yourself. I, I believe that this could change your life in the same way that it changed mine.